So, uh, بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to everyone attending uh, today's Kekesh Global Education Forum, which is held by Pediatric Ophthalmology Department. Uh, we're very happy and pleased uh, to have Dr. Evelyn Pacey with us today, who kindly accepted our invitation. She's a professor of ophthalmology and pediatric at Baylor College of Medicine, Houston, Texas, United States. And after finishing her medical college at California, at the University of California, San Francisco, she completed her residency of ophthalmology in the University of Southern California, Dohmi Eye Institute. And she did her pediatric ophthalmology fellowship in, um, in, at Indiana University School of Medicine. Her main clinical interest is in strabismus, pediatric ptosis, pediatric refractive surgery. And she's one of the pioneers uh, in the use of refractive surgery in children for refractive error associated with amblyopia. Today, she's going to be sharing with us her 19-year experience um, about refractive surgery in children. Uh, thank you, Dr. Evelyn, for being with us today, and we're very happy and excited to hear from you today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the nice introduction. I'd like very much for inviting me to speak today at your um, Global Education Forum. Um, it's really very uh, nice that we are now able to do these sorts of Zoom meetings and we've kind of catapulted from always having everything in person to being able to do um, tele, you know, telemedicine, teleeducation. Um, and that's like kind of a silver lining of what's happened out of COVID, um, you know, that we actually have um, really uh, changed the way we can do our education and meetings. And I'm excited about this. So um, anyway, thank you again for the invitation and also for Dr. Sesma for the invitation as well. And um, today I am, as you said, going to be speaking to you about my experience with refractive surgery in children. And let me share the screen here. Um, let's see. Go to this, just a sec here. Let's go to here. And okay. So, um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about my experience with uh, refractive surgery in children. And um, I'm going to start it out with who is basically who's an appropriate patient to think about for refractive surgery in children. And it's, and it's, it's really amblyopia for in a category. And, and we as uh, ophthalmologists or any, any physician, um, we're giving advice to our patients. And as a pediatric ophthalmologist, um, I tell patients, you know, you have amblyopia, just um, your, your child has amblyopia, just have your child wear a patch. Uh, several hours a day over her better seeing eye. And it sounds really simple, um, and it should be most of the time, but sometimes you have a patient like this one. <laughs> so, oops. Um, so, here, wait, go on. So another name for this, uh, this talk is Old and New Concepts in the Management of Severe Refractive Amblyopia. And that child, as you can see, would be very non-compliant with patching. Um, and so we, you know, there are certain patients that just don't, don't uh, um, follow the rule or play by our, our game, play our game. So there was a quote by Mark Zuckerberg that I think is right, pretty ap apropos for this whole idea of refractive surgery in children. Um, and it is, the biggest risk is not taking a risk at all. And, and back in 2001, actually 1999, when I started all of this, you know, if, if I hadn't pursued this idea of going through the motions of trying to get refractive surgery in children, we, we wouldn't be having this this discussion at all, and children that really have benefited would not have benefited from this treatment. So just for an example, um, this is a patient um, who I have taken care of and still do, um, and she was a former premature and um, who had retinopathy of prematurity laser, and it resolved well. Um, but as many people in this audience know, um, after ROP laser, you often get nearsightedness. And so seven months of age, she has this refractive error and a lot of anisometropia and glasses were prescribed. Um, 22 months later, 
she has this sort of refractive error. Look at how much she's changed in only, you know, 12 months. So her vision, as you can see, is uh, by, by teller acuity is poor with glasses, but she never wants to wear her glasses at all. So we keep trying to have her wear the glasses. We keep asking her to, her mother to have her patch her left eye. And after about, you know, all of this time, her, her mother is getting desperate and says, Dr. Pacey, isn't there anything else we can do? We are afraid she's going to be blind. She won't wear the glasses, she won't patch. So we did PRK on her eyes at 24 months of age. And this is the laser dose. Now you can see that we didn't fully treat the minus 15 because I limit my treatment to what the FDA has approved for my laser, which is a Vizek Star S4. And we treated this and uh, this is what we did. And six months post-op, she's now more compliant with patching. And fast forward six years, so she's now eight years old. And her current refractive error, as you can see here, is really quite excellent. And you can see that you, she, she actually got more response uh, to the laser than expected um, in, in, in that right eye. And what interestingly is, is um, the left eye is now a little bit more myopic than the right. Um, and look at her current vision. She's 2050 in the right eye, 2030 in the left. So a really remarkable and very, you know, pretty awesome success story. So the reasons that um, for failing uh, standard amblyopia therapy um, with refractive error are first due to severe anisometropia. And these patients have a normal eye and one eye with a high refractive error, and they often refuse to wear their glasses because they don't see a benefit. They see well with the normal eye. And also you get anisoconia, uh, which causes uh, discomfort or, or basically not quite diplopia in most kids, but just they won't wear their glasses because they feel off balance or whatever. And it also cosmetically, um, as the children get older, it becomes a social issue. There's also the group of severe isoamotropic patients, and these children um, have bilateral high refractive error. And you'd ask, you say to yourself, well, why would children that have bilateral high refractive error not wear their glasses? And you're you're absolutely, that's a great question because most children are compliant because they can't see without their glasses. However, um, you know, this is just showing you myopic, um, uncorrected vision of this nice, beautiful Eiffel Tower. So why would patients not wear glasses? Well, it's because they have other issues and most of them have neurobehavioral disorders. I have tactile aversion, anxiety, autistic behavior, ADHD, and sometimes there's this kid like this one and no, no matter what you do, she's gonna break those glasses because she doesn't like wearing them. And then sometimes there's just kids like this one who's just totally defiant and says, I'm not gonna wear those glasses no matter what. And so, you know, these patients consequently um, have very poor vision and visual stimuli then become adverse, noxious or frightening because they can't really tell what they are until they're too close to the face. And then it becomes like um, intimidating or scary. And in addition, um, they have difficulty interpreting what they're looking at. Um, Larry Tyson, who is a colleague of mine and also does a lot of pediatric refractive surgery in his, his career, has termed their condition visual autism because they live in an island of visual isolation um, and are actually often called autistic when they aren't. Other reasons for uh, treatment failure in refractive amblyopia or poor glasses fit, such as children with Down syndrome, or other craniofacial abnormalities with a, a very flat nasal bridge and the glasses fall down their face all the time. Um, patients with other sorts of anatomic abnormalities of the face, such as microtia, which makes it difficult to fit glasses. And then children with cerebral palsy or other reasons for neck weakness and their glasses just ride down lower than they're able to uh, use and, um, in a useful way. So historically, there is really no other treatment an option than trying contact lenses and glasses and these patients routinely would fail and the result was varying levels of severe visual impairment. But now there is um, this treatment option of reducing refractive error through laser. And so I'd like you to think of these children um, in a different way than routine garden variety amblyopia. 
Um, severe high refractive error that is untreated mm -hmm. will result in severe amblyopia. And the visual impairment that they can um, result is unlike the amblyopia that you can get with a dense infantile cataract. So it's a type of amblyopia that um, should be treated more aggressively than our routine mild to moderate amblyops. And surgery is optimal for both these types of, of uh, amblyopia causing you know, form vision deprivation type amblyopia. So um, extramural laser surgery by history has been around for a long time now. Um, over 30 years in adults, it's been used to reduce refractive error. And my colleague, Mitch Weikert, um, and I have been performing PRK in children uh, for 19 years that have severe refractive amblyopia. So it's really not that new of an idea, which is interesting. It's amazing, I'm getting old. Um, but for my, my story, it all started in 1999 when I was given a grant, um, when I just came on faculty at Baylor through the Knights Templar Young Inve Investigator uh, Fund. And I was given a, a grant for $20,000. And I spent about two years trying to make the study get going um, because there were many wrong turns and dead ends that I um, had to go through um, because lasers typically were housed in ambulatory clinics. We needed to find a place where we could do general anesthesia for these children. And um, so we first investigated having the anesthesiologist come to the, the laser suite in the uh, ambulatory area, which they all refused to do. And luckily, there is one company in the United States called SightPath that has, uses the roll-on, roll-off VizX mm -hmm. laser and travels around um, regions of the country where you can basically rent the laser for the day and do a, a group of, laser, of children. Um, and so that's how we ended up getting the study all ready and, and um, to go. And then we had um, a group, our first group of children. So um, in 2001, our pilot study included 11 children uh, in which we did PRK in one day. These children all had high anisometropia and severe amblyopia and were really in stage patients. They had failed standard therapy for a very long time. Um, we designed an anesthesia protocol uh, to test whether or not it affected the laser. Um, we did a safety, it was basically a safety study because we had no idea what children's corneas uh, would do to a, uh, an eczema laser um, treatment because we had no experience with them and corneas are different in children. So we followed these children for three years and um, evaluated their corneal refractive and visual outcomes. And what we found um, from this study um, was that that the corneas healed slightly faster than in adults, and there was, uh, it was very well tolerated with mild to moderate discomfort. And then three years properly, the refractive error reduction was accurate, or more than, uh, you got more response on the high myopic patients than the nomograms that we used, which were the adult nomograms. Visual acuity also improved, which was really not something we were looking at. It was mostly safety, but we found that many of the children got better and improved two to seven lines on the Snellen chart. One child improved to 2030, the youngest child we treated. There was minimal corneal haze and there was no keratectasia. And these children were not treated with mitomycin uh, topically um, during this treatment. So at that point, we decided to open up this procedure again, this study again, and we decided um, that these are the, the patient diagnoses that would be appropriate. So severe anisotropia the severe isoambotropes and the facial anomaly patients like we had talked about. And all patients had to have stand, had, had failed uh, the regular standard uh, refractive amblyopia therapy. So over the last 15 years that we've been re-enrolling or, or starting to enroll new patients, this is the number of patients I have, uh, we have treated over those years. So you can see there's, this is not a high volume um, procedure that we do at Texas Children's Hospital in Baylor. So 171 patients have been treated, 238 eyes, and you can see that distribution. 60% are isoimmetropic and 40% anisometropic. And this is the results that we've had on the refractive error followed out to five years. 
Um, so a lot of the patients we end up losing to follow up um, out farther, but we did get a significant number that we have the five year follow up. And you can see that the myop, the bile hours and unit hours have very similar outcomes on um, the spherical equivalent refractive error at time zero. You can see they're um, more myopic and they, be, they get close to Plano. Um, with a little bit of regression. And again, this whole group were patients before we started using mitomycin. In the last three years, uh, we have been, or actually two and a half years, we've been using mitomycin on the patients and the results are even better with less regression. Um, here is um, graphs that are showing you um, target versus achieved dose um, of the PRK treatment. And the, the the line in the middle of the little blue area is if you got perfectly what you we shot for. Um, so if you wanted to get 10 diopters, you received 10 diopters. And you can see that at uh, six months, which is upper left, uh, 12 months is um, the, this one. And this is two years and five years out. Um, you can see that um, they are basically close to within uh, one to two diopters of uh, desired uh, treatment dose, or treat refractive error result. Visual acuity also improved um, markedly in the patients, uh, especially the bilateral patients. Uh, you can see here the mean um, visual acuity at the beginning was 2630 and five years out, 2063 in this group. Uh, the unilaterals also improved significantly, but not quite as much um, though their starting point was, was slightly lower. This is a case that really started me wanting to do the, the bilateral patients, and, and she really um, is remarkable to this day. And I just wanted to give you a story. Uh, Dr. Casey, yeah, your sound sometimes go away. Oh, what to do? Let me see if I can. Yeah. Now it's okay. I don't know why I'm just sitting. It, it's probably the, the uh, Wi-Fi kind of having no. gaps. And I know, I think, okay, you can go ahead. If, I, if it happens again, I will let you know, thank you. Okay, let me know if you can't understand what I said and I need to repeat it, okay? It's okay, thank you. Okay, so, um, so this patient um, was a four-year-old when she um, was treated with PRK, but she has a chromosomal translocation and severe cognitive ability. And she was wheelchair bound um, at this time, extremely competitive. Um, I'd known her for a couple years um, uh, prior to her treatment. Um, and she really required for a, basically an examiner anesthesia for adequate evaluation of her retina. She was so um, um, scared of everyone and just wouldn't let you get close to her. And you could see this very you know, high refractive error that she had and she wouldn't I, I think it's your mic. I think it's your mic. Because you can see you. I think it's your mic, yeah. Is it better if I get this close? Is no, that better? Sometimes it's like um, uh, occluded or something. Maybe when you move your hand on the, on the laptop. It can, it, it's, now it's clear. So you said she... Well, let me see. Let me, let me ask you. Let me go. Does, does that make it cut out? This is the, how I'm forwarding the uh, slide. Does that make any change? And now it's okay, but sometimes it feels like there is a cloth or something over the mic that doesn't let the voice come. Yeah. Okay, I'm not sure. I'll, okay. I'll try to avoid whatever I'm doing. <laughs> okay. Sorry about it. Okay. So then she was treated and her, her treatment dose was 11.5 diopters. And, um, and so immediately after her surgery, basically after her laser, um, she um, had a refractive error of uh, minus 0 0.7 and this was out you know three months out and um oops let's see here uh oh now it's not going just a second okay so three months out she comes in walking with a walker she's never walked in her life so three months out she's now four years old and she's walking with a walker she's smiling she's not scared of me Six months out, she walks unassisted. She's really happy. She comes and hugs you. It's just an amazing change in her whole personality. And her parents now, it's 16 years out. Her refractive area is still stable, minus one in both eyes. Her corneas are clear. And they're just um, 
can't believe what you know how much of a change in their their life as well uh, this surgery did for her for their family uh, so from this patient I felt like gosh you know we're doing so much more than just improving vision um, in these children we should assess what what uh, you know what basically formally what else are we improving in these children <clears throat> so um, this just showing you this is the girl now she's 11 years out and obviously she's got cognitive disability, but she's interested, she's looking at toys, she's happy, and her mom is, as you can see, smiling in the background, very happy as well. And then here she is at 13 years old, she looks me in the eye, and she's just interested in things, and this is a totally different child than what she was when she was a four-year-old without being able to see. So this is a simulation of her repair uncorrected and how the world would look so you can see that you can see things but it, they're so out of focus at distance and when you get closer and closer you finally can get to the object and see it sharply but now you can only see a part of the person's face you can only see that the eye for example in this in this demonstration um, and so a patient can't really put together the whole image of the of the target of, of regard without kind of scanning all around it and in a patient that has cognitive disability that's almost impossible because their IQ is low and they don't have the the normal intellectual abilities that we we all have so um, anyway so we did a study looking at the developmental improvements after refractive surgery in a group of children with intellectual disability um, or neurobehavioral disorders, and it was that same group of patients, isoamotropia, they were bilateral patients with isoamotropia with these levels of uh, refractive error at a minimum. They all had to be non-compliant with refractive correction, and they all underwent bilateral PRK. In addition, they preoperatively and at intermittent variables out to, uh, or time periods out to three years had a battery of developmental tests performed um, on them. And the primary outcome was at six months and 36 months post-op, and it was the change in the developmental quotient in different subdomains of development, as you can read here. And the developmental quotient is, is a fraction or a percentage, basically, of the mental age in months divided by the biological age in months times 100. So a DQ of 100 would be normal. So um, basically, anyone that has developmental intellectual disability will over time have a decreasing DQ because their IQ will plateau, uh, though their biological age will continue to increase. So any improvement in DQ is basically unheard of in developmental pediatrics. Um, the secondary outcomes that we looked at were the normal ophthalmologic outcomes, um, uncorrected and best corrected visual acuity, cycloplegic refraction, and corneal status. And the developmental testing that we did was that everyone got a Vineland II study or, uh, done, and then the lower the children had a Bailey scales of infant and toddler development test done, and the children that were of higher intellectual ability had the Beery VMI test done at each visit that at, at pre-op six months, 12 months, 12, 24, and 36 months. And just as I had mentioned before, you can see the, the green line is the normal uh, line of devel development, mental age and, and biological age, same. But in a, a child with developmental uh, in, you know, disability, they plateau out on their IQ, their mental age, but their biological age keeps in increasing. So you can see that this gap gets wider with time, and so the DQ will uniformly decrease. So at age two, a DQ of this, for example, this patient would be 25, but at eight years of age, it has gone down to 15. And um, this is just standard for children that with dis intellectual disability. But what we found in this group was that these children at six months had improvements in all of these areas of development. Um, in communication, daily living skills, and socialization, and these were all statistically significant values. All of the other subdomains, um, DQs, improved as 
but not statistically significantly. However, as I've mentioned, any improvement is really never seen in these patients. And so um, being static means that they have not decreased and they are continuing to develop. And also that is clinically significant. So at 36 months, the subdomains um, had all plateaued on the DQs um, and they weren't statistically significant, but once again, it's remarkably clinically significant due to their intellectual disability and IQ that has plateaued out. So these are just some comments from some of the parents that we've treated over the years uh, that had bilateral PRK. Um, and so it, how, and how much it really changed their family's lives. Um, you've given us such a gift. Our child who used to sit in the back, in the corner rocking back and forth now positively interacts with the family. Where she once just sat there frightened and combative whenever anyone or anything came near her, she now smiles and wants to play. And then lastly, this one I think is the most poignant for all of us uh, physicians and surgeons is um, thank you for trying to help our child when no one else thought it was worth it because he has so many disabilities. They thought he really didn't need to see very much. And that's just really like important for us all to realize we should be able to help these children when we can and not make the decision that it's not worth it, especially when it's something very simple that takes very little time and makes such a difference. So, um, a big question that everyone gets concerned about is what um, are the corneal um, issues with pediatric PRK long-term? And um, prior to the study that we just published, there wasn't much, there wasn't anything to date really published except for little things inside of other um, anecdotal case, uh, case series. And so we looked at this, a group of patients that had at least five years of follow-up um, after our PRK for either anisometropic or isometropic amblyopia. And we, we did biometry and, and topography to look for any signs of keratectasia or any problems with corneal thickness. And then we did regular, you know, the visual acuity, refractive error and corneal uh, haze issue um, uh, data points as well. And what we found in this group thus far, and we continue to, to uh, look at these patients, we had 12 eyes in this study that was published um, and there were 10 eyes with high myopia and two eyes that were highly high, hyperopic astigmatism patient. And they were followed out um, for at least five years, but the mean range of follow-up, or the mean range was 12 years out. Um, I'm sorry, the mean age at follow-up was 12 years out and the mean follow-up was 6.1 years from uh, the range with five to eight years. And what we found was that their corneal thickness uh, was stable. So preoperatively, you can see that uh, the cornea is uh, thicker, but then we do the laser. So we, of course, remove the epithelium and the stroma to the, whatever the dose you needed to do. So it reduced, but then the epithelium grew back and it stayed here. So this has been, um, at the last follow-up, um, the difference between here and here is basically the stromal treatment that was done for the PRK and they were uh, stable. The keratometry has also been extremely stable in the group. You can see here they're slightly flatter because of the laser, mostly the patients were myopic, um, but you don't see any progressive uh, steepening um, in this group. And then their absolute value of refractive error um, also shows that it was uh, significantly improved um, in both the myopic and hyperopic cohorts. The patients that um, had some change in their refractive error from myopia um, appear to be due to axial elongation in the group uh, rather than regression uh, of the um, myopic PRK treatment. As you can see here, uh, the group uh, had uh, an increase in their axial length by about one millimeter over the five years. And there were basically no complications. There were no, the patients had no corneal haze and there was no keratectasia. So uh, to summarize the, the results of this study, there was no corneal haze. There was no change in keratometric measurements from post-op, um, immediately post-op to last follow-up. 
um, no topic graphic evidence of keratectasia, and the refractive error change at five years corresponds to more to the axial elongation and not to regression of PRK treatment effect. So this is a nice um, kind of long-term uh, corneal safety study. So um, next I just wanna jump into who is appropriate to think about and when should we think about doing PRK. And the minimum age ever treated a patient is two years of age. And that's a pretty, there's pretty few patients that have come in that quickly because you need to type to sh enough time to show true failure in standard therapy. Also the corneas in children under two years of age change a lot. They're very soft in uh, under two years of age and the corneal rigidity increases a, a significant amount after two years of age. Also, there's a tremendous amount of eye growth in the first two years of age, as you can see here. So this graph here um, is the axial uh, length of a patient. So at two years of age, you can see from zero to two, how much your eye grows from you know, 14 to 15 millimeters up to 21 um, at two years of age. And after that, it's a lot slower growth here. So a lot less change there. Also keratometrically, your eye, your cornea gets a lot flatter in the first two years and then plateaus out. And then lastly, the lens power also decreases really rapidly in the first two years and then slowly, but not quite as slowly as other indices, um, goes down further out. So for that reason, we have the, the threshold of not doing PRK before two years of age. The contraindications for pediatric corneal refractive surgery are the same as in a, um, a suspicion for keratoconus or keratoglobus, history of herpes uh, keratitis, a thin cornea for any reason. Patients with significant collagen disorders should be a uh, someone that you should probably watch for a while and maybe not do at all, and patients with a history of dry eye. Children with Down syndrome are also some are children that I hesitate with um, and follow longer because of their higher incidence um, of keratoconus in this group and their propensity to rub their eyes. So be very careful if you consider doing taking on um, pediatric refractive surgery in your children to think about that that group. Um, the good thing now, though, with with keratoconus is that we do have. Uh, cross-linking available if anyone ever keratoconus or keratoctasia uh, that there is a treatment. Um, I've never had anyone yet, um, thanks God, but, <laughs> um, but we do have a, a treatment for that and I am cautious with Down syndrome. Um, relative contraindications for pediatric refractive surgery include the lack of form vision. So if you have a really severely hypoplastic optic nerve, um, you shouldn't do PRK on that patient. However, if the patient has mild cortical visual impairment or a mild optic nerve anomaly um, that you think, that, I mean, they are fixating and following, they just have a much better other eye. Um, you can, th those are patients that um, you could consider still treating. Um, what is the definition of, quote, failure to standard amblyopia therapy? Well, I think that depends on each surgeon. For me, I'm pretty conservative about it. I make them truly fail a significant period of time. And so they have to be non-compliant or non-responsive to standard therapy, including patching or atropine, if appropriate, and refractive correction with contacts or glasses. Um, I feel they need to fail at least six months, but I've almost never treated anyone that quickly. It's at least one year of maximum standard therapy before I'll treat them. When I talk to families about it, it's important that you clearly identify the goals of the treatment and to set appropriate expectations for the parents. Because the goal is not to get 2015 vision like we are in adults. Um, we are trying to prevent blinding levels of amblyopia, and it's important that the parents understand that. So we explain to them, we probably won't get 20-20 vision, but our idea, our goal is to improve your child's vision from the big E on the chart to somewhere better than that, and hopefully the best it can be, or better than counting fingers at two feet to 2200. So you want to make sure that you give them um, reasonable expectations of improvement. 
And also we let them know that spectacle independence may not be the goal. Many of these children don't wanna wear glasses, in fact, all of them initially, but we find that after they get better vision um, through PRK, they often are more compliant with refractive correction later. So let them know that it is likely that we will still want them to be wearing glasses if needed, and especially the unilateral patients that may have um, significant residual amblyopia that would cause them to not be able to do all of their activities of daily living, driving, et cetera, if they ever lost their better seeing eye. So, you know, from a safety standpoint, that's when we would always give glasses. So this um, um, slide just kind of talk, is showing you what I think is a reasonable strategy for pediatric refractive surgery. And I haven't talked about anything but eczema laser because that beyond the scope of this this lecture, but there are other, um, there is refractive lensectomy and phagic intraocular lenses for very high refractive rate that's beyond the eczema laser. And so I think that it's appropriate to treat with eczema laser up until somewhere around minus 13 or so, uh, maybe even a minus 15, depending on the patient and eczema laser up to about plus seven, even though you won't, you know you're gonna leave a residual hyperopia on this side. Um, patients that are on the eczema laser um, can either be treated with lensectomy, uh, with intraocular lens implant, um, or a fake intraocular lens if their anterior chamber depth is thick enough, um, or deep enough, I mean. So um, that's my strategy for these patients. So, just to summarize, when do I consider pediatric refractive surgery? Um, it is for a small subset of patients that have severe refractive error and amblyopia not responding to standard therapy. You want to think about this as a paradigm shift when thinking about the type of amblyopia these children have. Their severe amblyopia is not unlike deprivation amblyopia from, form, from some sort of form vision um, deprivation etiology, such as a cataract or severe ptosis. And you need to do it now when the child is in the age of visual plasticity of the, of the visual cortex, um, or it will be too late and doing a laser will do no good because they will be visually mature. In also, if a complication occurs, it will most likely be many years in the future and treatments are available for anything that may happen. And from my study that was recently published, um, it looks at five years out, there is no care dictation in any of our patients, and it's extremely rare that any pediatric refractive surgery patient has ever developed care dictation, um, and even in adult population with PRK. If a complication occurs, it will be a seeing eye, and it will be worth the rehabilitative effort. If we do nothing in these children, um, you basically have an eye that's pretty unhelpful. And so um, we want to have these patients have the best, seeing, um, best sight in each of their eyes so that if something happens in the future, um, you can rehabilitate them to that level and um, it is worth it. So to summarize, pediatric PRK results in long-term improvements in all of these areas, active error, visual acuity, communication skills, activities, daily living, socialization skills, and there have been no serious complications long-term. And I think that all of this translates into an objective improvement in quality of life. And I think at this point, I just wanted to thank all of the people that have worked with me over the years um, in, in this effort um, listed here. And it, it really does take a huge group of people um, to, to do all of this work and the support of my hospital, Texas Children's Hospital, and these grants um, that I have been able to do this research, the Knights Templar Eye Research Foundation and the Thrasher Research Fund. <clears throat> so at this point, um, I'll open it up for questions uh, from anyone that may um, have a question. Thank you so much, Dr. Irving. That's a, a great experience. And uh, I wish one day we can implement this in our hospital. We do have a lot of cases of amblyopia, unfortunately, and uh, families uh, find difficult time to get to, to, to be stick to the glasses and the patching. 
Um, there is a question from one of the, um, from Dr. Manal Hadrawi, she's a pediatric ophthalmologist. She's asking about the anesthesia. The anesthesia, you cut out a little bit there. They're asking yeah, about the anesthesia protocol. Okay, so yes, yeah. yeah, so, so we, after, there is a published paper on the protocol that we used to use, but actually we found over the years that it's, it's you don't have to go to such detail as I, uh, such caution as um, in that paper. So what we do is we try to minimize the volatile gases because volatile gas will affect the laser function. But what we do in all of our patients is we do a small examiner anesthesia um, prior to the laser. So the patient's in basically induced with nitrous, but as soon as they put an LMA in and change over to propofol. And then they turn the gas off. And during that time, we are doing an exam under anesthesia where we are remeasuring their keratometry. We're doing an intraocular, we do a, a tonal pin pressure. We do an anterior segment exam with a, with this, a portable slit lamp and we do an A scan. And that all takes about 10 minutes or so to do. And during that time, whatever may have been released from the nitrous is well away from everything. And then we basically do the laser. We tape down um, the LMA with a 1010 drape so that anything that might come out from the LMA is directed toward the feet so it's not in the laser field area. And we've had, we've never had any problems with uh, We also published um, on that study the, that it's, a, it's an old study from like 19 or 2004 um, on and it's also in my AOS thesis. Um, but basically it showed that the treatment effect was accurate and um, there was no complications from having the procedure. So that's how we do it. Um, so if you wanted to look up that paper, um, it does give you kind of a step-by-step -step on the methodology. But during that, when back in that first day, we used to induce in a different room and then bring them into our laser room. But we don't do that anymore. Okay. So uh, there is another question. Um, do you think there is any problems with the eye tracking system uh, compared to adults? I'm not sure. Okay, so no. Okay, so the tracking works really well. Um, and should I stop sharing my screen so I can see everyone or is it? Yeah, fine? it's okay. You can stop, yeah. Okay. Um, there we go. Okay, so, um, so the tracker works very well on the VisX. However, it does not protect you against obliquity of the eye. You know, of the eye. So it will center, but if your eye is tilted a little bit, it, it won't correct for that. So the way that we have um, done, and it's explained also in that same article that was published, um, before I get started, I center the, the everything, you know, just like you would normally do a refractive surgery. So there's a light reflex and you get it centered in the pupil. And then before I start, I have someone get at eye level with the iris just to make sure there's no subtle tilt. So again, it's, it's an estimate. Um, it's not as good as if the patient was awake, um, but it's what we can do in children. Um, and there is a study, I think that study looked at centration that same study, There's, there is something back from the way back when <laughs> that looked at centration and it found that all the patients were within a half a millimeter um, of center. So it is uh, accurate. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's as good as we can get with, with children under anesthesia. Okay. Um, another question is what laser machine do you use? The Vizek Star S4. And the only reason, I mean, like I use that laser because it is, uh, there's the company that has the, it's the only transportable laser that is approved by the FDA that can be moved around on a, in, in a truck. Um, and um, that's, we don't own our own laser in Texas Children's Hospital. So we need to have the, that company bring the laser to the hospital. But other lasers would be fine to use as well if you have access to general anesthesia and another, and with another laser. It's just okay. a little bit. So one of the questions, uh, what do you mean by failure? Is it the patient not compliant to treatment modality or he didn't respond to the treatment? When you what do I mean by failure? Yeah, so either one. So non-compliant or non-response cons is considered a failure. So now I would say the non-compliant patients 
tend to have the better result. So because they have basically a lot cleaner slate of plasticity in their brain. The compliant children that just kind of plateaued out and never got better, even though they're doing what they're supposed to do, they have a little bit of improvement, but not as marked as the non-compliant kids. Okay, that's clear. Do you, do you use intraoperative mitomycin for all cases or it depends on the degree of correction you're using? So now I use it on everyone. So I didn't use it at all until um, I watched other people's results for a while. Like Dr. Tyson was doing it for a long time. Dr. Astell in, in uh, Canada was using mitomycin and their results were really good. They had no complications. And so the results from regards to corneal clarity and stability of refractive correction are so much better <laughs> with mitomycin um, that I'm so happy that I'm, I've added it to my, my, my therapy. Now I do 20 to 30 seconds, no more than 30 seconds, and it's the 0.02%. And I irrigate with two bottles of BSS after. And um, they are crystal clear, and they also have less pain um, after the surgery. So it's, it's been a great addition to the patients. Now, if it was a Down syndrome patient, I don't think I would do mitomycin just because I'm already worried about them. Yeah, you know, like I hardly ever do Down syndrome anymore anyway with PRK because I'm concerned about their corneas. Okay. So what is your steroid regimen? Do you use it after the epithelium is healed? Okay. So um, my post-op regimen immediately after is I uh, give, uh, there's Vigamox or Moxifloxacin drop. I put a contact lens on and then I use Pred Forte, one drop, I put a shield over their eyes and then they go home using Vigamox and Pred Forte four times a day for a week. Then I see them five to seven days after the procedure, remove the contact lens and I switch them over to FML four times a day. And that depends on the patient. I can sometimes decrease to two times a day at four months out or just do four times a day for six months. So um, I usually can now with mitomycin decrease to, four, to two times a day after four months. Okay, so there's a question about the ICL. Um, the, um, um, the first part of the question, do you do PRK in partial accommodative ET cases or not? I have not yet, um, you, but you I've always been considering it. It's just the problem that I don't, okay, so, so with regards to what's the better response to PRK, hyperopia versus myopia is so much better. Um, you get regression with hyperopia, though I'm seeing a lot less with the mitomycin now. So I just don't have a lot of hyperopes that I, to say for sure that it's going to be more stable. So, you know, a partially accommodative isotrope, it depends on their level. If they're plus four, you know, and there's, and you know, it would be worth doing, but you know, plus seven, you're not, they're not going to be good. <laughs> you know, it's just not enough so, because the laser is so limited on how much hyperopic treatment it can get. So um, from my standpoint, I think it's okay. There's been a few studies looking at that, but I don't think it's a really slam dunk. Yay. Awesome thing. <laughs> so uh, what is your experience with the ICL? And do you have a special consideration when you reg regarding the size of using the ICN? The okay, so I, I don't do that procedure. Um, I refer them to Larry Tyson, who has a huge experience in using ICLs. And he, I think now, I'm not, I can't really say for him, but he used to use the iris fixated lens most. But I think he has recently switched over to a the different the the, the posterior chamber uh, lens more, which I think is easy. It's easier to insert and easier to change out as well. But um, but he has a, the best ex most experience in my uh, for me and to talk about ICLs. So in my hospital right now too, there none of our refractive surgeons are doing pediatric ICLs. We just refer them all to Larry, <laughs> Dr. Tyson. So there's a question, have you seen retinal detachment after uh, cataract aspiration in children, after lens aspiration? Oh, uh, sure, Every, yeah. I mean, there's a few patients that end up getting retinal detachments. Um, um, my, my, I, I personally don't do cataract surgery anymore. I haven't done cataract surgery since we had some 
another person who came who wanted like 20 years ago probably um and she took we kind of subdivided our group into what things we really liked and i stopped doing cataract um but there are some and, and actually we had i mean it would, it's usually the the pre the the um preemies with rop that had high myopia that i've seen retinal detachments after cataract surgery but um but certainly children can get retinal detachments with with um, intraocular surgery of any kind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what is the laser setting uh, and treatment transition zone you use? So I, it depends on the patient's corneal thickness. So you always, you want to use a large zone with a blend if you can. So depending on how much you're treating, it's basically depth about 12 microns of corneal removal per diopter treatment. So you have to kind of look at the math and I don't make the cornea any thick, thinner than about 370 microns after treatment. So I have to calculate it and figure it out. And sometimes you have to use a smaller zone or not blend if their corneas are thinner. So you just have to, it's a kind of an individual calculation each time. And do you use cyclorefraction when you do these cases? Yes. Okay. So, um, you know, we, 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 in, um, um, between us, pediatric ophthalmologists, we talk a lot about using atropine 0.01% and treatment mm -hmm. of myopic patient. Can you share with us your experience with this drop? So, so yeah, I do the same. And, um, and I found that it seems to be, now you never know what the natural history would have been on that patient, but it seems like this patient that is progressing seems to stabilize and definitely, you know, like I've had patients that have been on it for a year and a half and they've had no change in their refractive error. So, but then there are that have had a little bit of, you know, you know, progression, but I don't, I think it was, it's slower than what was happening before starting the atropine. The question I have with atropine is how long do we want to use it? You know, and some of these are kids are kids, like they're five years old or three years old. And these studies are two years of using atropine and then a, a one-year washout but it doesn't make sense to stop when they're seven years old when they're going to continue to progress so that's that's my question is can we just keep these kids on for years you know if you start them at five or six years old can you use it through their four, 14 15 years old and i you just don't know the answer to that question and um and we're kind of just playing it by ear right right at this point you know yeah. how about your how about your thoughts on that we don't have it in the hospital, and some patients are asking those who go to private clinics. But what is the youngest age you use it for, and the refractive error that you you start using the drops with? So I don't think there's an absolute on that. For um, I would say that I wouldn't use it before three years of age. Um, I, I don't think I've ever had a three-year-old that I put it on though. But I think if, if I saw someone that was minus four at three years of age. Um, I, it wouldn't be something I'd be scared of, you know, but I haven't yet done that. So five years old, I think is the earliest I put someone on it. Um, and we have to, you know, have a compounding pharmacy make it for us. Um, so they'll, there's one that we use that can make a three month supply, which is nice so that it's not so frequent that they're having to go back and forth to get the drop and, um, and it can last that long, which is nice. Um, and, there's actually a recent study, or they're looking at that 0.03% that might be more effective than the 0.01%. And I'm interested to see what more studies show on that um, percentage to see if it's better than the 0.01. Okay. I think we answered most of the questions. Uh, thank you so much. It was a great talk. Uh, we, we learned a lot today. And hopefully in future, we can implement it in King Khaled Eye Specialist Hospital. If your sister, oh. you have any words? Uh, yeah, you can. Well, I hope you can too, because I think that it is, um, it's a great addition to what we can do for these children. And it's, I, it's not dangerous. It really works. And we have 20 years of experience with children now. Um, and, you know, not only me, I mean, Larry Tyson has a huge experience with this. So, um, and he's an excellent surgeon too, and, and a very, um, you know, reputable, very good person too. And so he has many more patients because he does more patients than I do. I think his threshold is a little easy, like lower, like he'll treat patients without making them 
fail as long as me. Maybe I should ease my my uh, my criteria a little bit because I he has a great experience with it with great results as well, um, and it is a really good treatment for these kids. And I think it should be part of everyone's treatment toolbox. Yes, I agree with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Evelyn. Thank you everyone for attending and hopefully we'll meet in future. Yes, that would be great. Be safe. I'd be happy to come and help you guys set up if you ever, if you can yeah, get you're most, you're most welcome. We will, we will be happy to have you. Thank you so much. All right, you guys take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.